Thank you everyone for joining us today. Welcome to Trauma Sensitive Programming Using Mindfulness to Create Safe Spaces from Jen Carson. We are using Zoom for today's webinar. The exiting the full screen mode is the fastest and easiest way to access chat and closed captions. Click on view options at the top of the screen and select exit full screen. You are all automatically muted upon entry to share questions or comments with your fellow attendees, the presenter and the rest of the hosts. Please use the chat function. You can access chat by clicking on the chat icon to open the chat window. Be sure to select panelists hosts, or sure, just like everyone, apologies, the Zoom has done a little update, um, to share your comments and questions with everyone. We are providing live closed captioning today. To access closed captions, click on the closed caption icon on the menu panel. If you need technical support during the webinar, please use the Q&A function. The chat panel can scroll quickly, and this ensures that we can provide assistance to you. You may also use the Q&A function to ask questions for the speaker. You may need to adjust the audio settings. If you have trouble hearing me or the speakers, audio settings are on the lower left-hand side of the Zoom panel. You may need to change your output method. If you find that the audio is too loud or too soft, adjust the volume level on your speaker, headset, or computer. Oops, wow, well, I don't know what happened there, okay. That is not the end of the slideshow. Sure, I'm just gonna go ahead and, um, Jen, I'm gonna go ahead and hand that off to you. I'm not sure what, ha what happened, but I want to um, just take a real quick minute um, for everyone here today. So that is, um, you want me to share my screen? I'm gonna do a quick, I wanna do this quick, um, a couple of things. Sure, um, there we go, I'll just move my presentation over here. I'm not sure why it stopped at that point, but I wanna welcome everyone to this pilot. Spotlight Speaker Series from Region 6 of the Network of the National Library of Medicine. We really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to be here with us. A quick word about who we are before we get too far into the presentation. Region 6 of the Network of the National Library of Medicine is one of the regional medical libraries um, that does outreach for the network of the National Library of Medicine. And um, we are funded by the National Library of Medicine, which is one of the National Institutes of Health. Right now, you're probably most familiar with the National Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases, where Dr. Fauci is at. I want to take a quick moment to give everyone attending today a permission slip. We are in the midst of a global pandemic and collective trauma. Uh, we encourage you to prioritize your wellness during this webinar. We may be covering some tri triggering topics for everyone. Please feel free to doodle, color, knit, move your body in a way that feels good to you, eat, drink, take a break, or whatever you need to do to take care of yourself during this presentation. Your wellness is more important than anything, including this webinar. I am gonna stop sharing my screen. Jen, thank you for being here. I am gonna turn off my camera. All right, thanks Bobby for having me. I'm gonna share my screen. All right. Everybody can see my screen now. Uh, I'm sure you'll tell me if you can't. So thank you very much for uh, joining me. Uh, this is Trauma Sensitive Programming Using Mindfulness to Create Safe Space. Um, and this applies to libraries, but of course it can also um, apply to any community organization. So who am I? I'm Jen Carson. Um, I'm a librarian, library director here in Woodstock, New Brunswick, Canada. I'm also a physical literacy researcher. Some of you may know me from my work um, with uh, movement-based programs in libraries. I'm a yoga teacher as well, and a meditation teacher, um, and I'm also an author. Uh, I'm also a trauma survivor. Um, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist, um, but I do have experience uh, working with people that are, have been traumatized um, through my yoga and meditation teaching, as well as I'm a self-defense coach. Um, and I also used to work with children with behavioral um, and developmental issues, many of whom came from a trauma environment as well. So uh, I, I understand uh, some of the issues, but I'm not a doctor and uh, I cannot uh, give advice um, on specific medical conditions or issues, but I am going to tell you how to try to create some safe spaces in your library for people um, who may be dealing with trauma and trying to heal from it, which as Bobby mentioned, <laughs> collectively is sort of all of us right now. Um, we're all feeling a bit traumatized, some of us more than others. 
Um, so first, I am a physical literacy researcher, as I mentioned, um, and physical literacy does actually play a large part into uh, trauma and healing from trauma. So I'm just going to talk about that for a few minutes before we get into uh, some deeper stuff. Um, so physical literacy, this is my definition from my book, um, is the motivation, ability, confidence, and understanding to move the body throughout the life course, so for your whole life, um, as is appropriate to each person's capacity, the development of fundamental movement skills that permit a person to move with confidence and control in a wide range of actions, such as throwing, skipping, balancing, all different kinds of body movements, um, and in different environments, like movie, you move differently on snow than you do on grass, or in the water, or on the, you know, if you're jumping in the air versus walking on slippery ice, it's very different kinds of movement. Um, and this also applies to people with disabilities or exceptionalities. Um, they too uh, have physical literacy and can enhance their physical literacy. Um, and so it really grinds my gears when people talk about physical literacy only within the context of what we consider able bodies. Um, and all bodies are, in my opinion, able bodies, just differently abled. Um, and so, how does physical literacy um, tie in with trauma? So here's some of the concepts of physical literacy and how trauma can affect or apply to those. So energy and motion. So you can't have an emotion without some sort of motion in your body. Um, so if you think about when you're happy, your face lights up and maybe you feel more buoyant inside when you're frustrated, maybe you not even notice it, but oh, you're kind of holding your breath and you're clenching and tightening your muscles. Um, so when we express our emotions safely through movement, that gives us greater compassion for ourselves and also empathy for others. And when we're blocked and we're not able to do that, our systems become dysregulated. Uh, so interoception is when we become aware of our body's internal processes. So you guys can all do that right now. Uh, think about how your body feels on the inside. Um, like, are you hungry? Is your tummy growling? Are you thirsty? Is your heart rate going fast or slow? Does your skin feel itchy? Are your clothes uncomfortable in your body? Some people, especially people with developmental um, disabilities or uh, people that are neurotypical have a very different awareness of their body um, and its processes than more neurotypical people. And people with trauma often experience the same thing. When we suffer from PTSD, that system becomes dysregulated as well. So something that maybe in our previous pre-trauma life didn't bother us, but now drives us crazy. Um, or we don't notice uh, things that are happening inside of our body. So um, like breathing, heart rate, hunger, and sleep cues, we might miss those. We might not, we might have insomnia and might not be able to fall asleep because we're anxious. Um, or we might not notice when we're hungry and not eat, or we might feel like a gnawing sensation of hunger all the time. Um, and so it really changes our interoception. And then proprioception is what's happening outside of your body. So it's awareness of your body in time and space. And that helps us navigate our changing environments and it improves our spatial abilities when we have more proprioceptive awareness. But trauma um, affects how we interpret our environments. And so example, something that you may not interpret as being dangerous pre-trauma, um, might, you might see danger everywhere post-trauma. You might be always scanning your environment looking for danger. Or if you have a propensity to um, freezing as opposed to kind of fight or flight, you might not notice your environment at all and you might feel really shut down and stuff may be going on around you and you're just sort of disassociated from it. So people have vastly different responses to trauma um, and the, they're all valid um, and they all affect your physical literacy. Then there's temporal awareness. So we develop timing by moving through life's daily rhythms, eating and sleeping and the sun going up and going down, going to bed. And we develop body awareness and learning to predict outcomes. This leads us to us having an ability to analyze environmental data and make predictions about what's going to happen next. And anyone who's gone through uh, trauma knows that trauma distorts our perception of time. It makes it difficult to predict temporally what's going to happen. So if you're in a car accident, for some people, it, they'll say, oh, it all happened so fast. And then for other people, it might be like time moved really slowly, like they're kind of moving through sand, like one of those dreams where you're trying to run and you can't move and like two seconds feels like three hours. So when we're experiencing trauma, our nervous system freaks out and we don't have that same temporal awareness that we do. And so uh, increasing our physical literacy can help bring us back into temporal balance.
And then moving on to balance, we'll talk about the vestibular system. So our vestibular system helps us sit still and controls our posture and our balance, like even just sitting in a chair, it gives us muscle tone. Um, and we might fidget because we're trying to calm down and concentrate. So like Bobby said earlier, you know, if, if you feel like you have an easier time listening to me by playing with an elastic band or squeezing a ball or knitting or tapping your foot or whatever, that's perfectly okay. That's your body's system trying to regulate itself so you can pay attention. And that's, we need to normalize that, that that's okay to do that. Um, so when we have vestibular to maturity, we learn that through movement. Um, and if something impinges our freedom of movement, like uh, being in a traumatic situation, that, that suffers and we don't um, achieve vestibular maturity as easily. Uh, it's, really, it's really rough with children. Um, I, I used to work with a lot of children um, that had been through traumas and they had a hard time just sitting in a chair. It would just slide off their chairs. Um, they just didn't have enough um, balancing power to be able to sit upright. Um, and it was like their insides had gone all mushy. Um, like they, their muscle tone was collapsed um, because they were kind of in a state, um, you know, like an internal state of sort of apathy. Um, or you have the opposite where someone's super rigid and like this all the time. And so trauma can affect um, just our sense of balance, which might not be something you thought of before. And then taking risks as well. So when we gently push boundaries, we wire our brains to feel more comfortable with uncertainty. And that gives us the courage to try new things and the perseverance to keep going when things get difficult. And it gives us the confidence to feel like, yes, we can go into the world and make decisions. But trauma destroys our boundaries and we may not take as many risks or we might take too many risks, okay? Um, so these are just some terms that are used in physical literacy, but that also apply uh, to trauma. So I just wanted to share those with you. And then we're going to talk about mindfulness. So mindfulness is a component of all of those things, right? So I was asking you to think about being aware of what's going on inside and outside of your body. So let's just do that right now. So I'm going to just stand here. I'm at a standing desk. I'm going to lower it in a minute so I don't get too tired. Um, but let's just stand or sit. And I want you to just notice quietly what's happening around you. So where are you? Are you at your house? Are you at your office? Can you hear noises? Are there bright lights? I have like these obnoxious fluorescent lights in my office. Are you wearing glasses? Can you feel them on your face? Are you, are you wearing earrings or a hat or a headband? Are you wearing a tie? Is it tight on your neck? Are you hungry? How's your heart rate feel? How's your skin feel? How's the temperature in the room? Are you sleepy? Do you feel like you need a cup of coffee or a cup of tea? Just noticing sort of what's going on inside of you and then also what's going on outside of you. Do you hear any noises? What time of day is it? What are the people around you doing? What about the animals around you if you're at home and you have animals with you or if you're lucky enough to have animals at work with you? And just take a moment here and just see what's happening in your environment. So when we learn to pay more attention to our environment, that helps us become more sensitive to people who may be experiencing trauma um, and are the after effects of it. So we can start thinking more mindfully about how we design our spaces and design our programs um, in a way that makes people more comfortable. And people, I'm going to lower my chair at my table here so I can sit with you guys if you're sitting. Um, people also talk a lot about the benefits of meditation. Now, I've been practicing meditation for probably 20 years um, at least. And um, it is a really wonderful tool. Um, but it's it also can be triggering because um, especially like I've mentioned this before in other webinars, we're in the middle of a respiratory pandemic and we're asking people to pay attention to their breathing. So for some people that can cause them a lot of anxiety because maybe they have fear about the pandemic and about sickness. And so thinking about paying attention to their breathing actually makes them feel more panicky. So we're gonna do a little um, concentrated effort together in mindfulness, which is, so meditation is just taking all that mindfulness we did and doing it as collectively as like a little uh, exercise. But if you don't feel comfortable doing that, it makes you feel anxious or you just don't want to, that's okay. Um, you're still a good person. <laughs> I can't see you anyway, so I won't feel bad if you don't participate. 
Um, but let's just sit here and we're going to practice a little tiny mindfulness meditation together. Um, so I'm going to sit with my feet flat on the floor so I can ground my feet into the ground. You can do that too if you want. If you're more comfortable sitting cross-legged or lying down, you can do that too. And then I'm gonna place my hands on my thighs. You can place your hands on your thighs if you like. I'm gonna close my eyes because that feels more comfortable for me because I can close out all that external stimulus. I have the tendency to get really distracted by things around me. So I'm gonna close my eyes. You do what works for you. And then I'm gonna place a hand on my belly because I wanna think about my breathing here. And I'm gonna try not to have judgments about my belly, <laughs> but it doesn't matter if they come up. I'm just gonna place my hand on my belly. And then I'm gonna inhale and exhale. And as I inhale, my belly goes out. And as I exhale, my belly comes in. And as I inhale, my belly goes out. And as I exhale, my belly comes in. I'm gonna do this a few more times. So I get that feeling in my belly of it going in and out. And I'm dropping my breath down into the lower lobes of my lungs. I'm relaxing my shoulders, relaxing my jaw, maybe giving my nose a little wiggle, relax my face. <sighs> I'm gonna let go of my belly and just place my other hand on my other thigh. And I'm just gonna follow my breath. And then thoughts are gonna come into my mind because that's what minds are for. They're designed to scan the horizon looking for danger, opportunities. And so when a thought comes into my mind, I'm just like, oh, hello thought, thank you, <laughs> bye. And send it on its way and come back to my breath. And then maybe another thought comes in, like, oh, how much longer should we do this for? And then I'm like, oh, it's okay, it doesn't matter. You can keep breathing. And then the thought goes away. And I just focus on the breath coming in and out of the body. Inhaling and exhaling. In a moment, I'm gonna ring a bell and I don't want it to startle any of you. So I'm just letting you know that ahead of time, but I'm gonna ring a little singing bowl just to bring us out of the meditation. But if some of you are easily startled, you might wanna mute. And if you're finding it hard to lose, leave your thoughts behind, you get lost in them, that's okay. Come back to the breath. We generally have the same thoughts over and over and over again all day. You're not missing anything, I promise. <laughs> Inhaling and exhaling. Good. If your eyes were closed with me, you can slowly open your eyes. I'm going to take my little librarian glasses off here for a second and rub my hands together and put them on my face and just kind of give my face a nice little massage. Just give myself one more little sensory break before I open my eyes. And then I'll put my glasses back on. I can't see you anyway, but I need to see my presentation. Um, so that was an experience of concentrated mindfulness in something that we call meditation. And a lot of people think that meditation is clearing your mind of thoughts, but you're human. You're never going to clear your mind of thoughts. The, the point of meditation is to just, it's like a wave. You watch the thoughts come and then they go and you watch them come and then they go. And, and that's okay. We, it, they're like, uh, it's like you're watching the sky and sometimes the clouds come by and they're friendly, puffy little clouds. And sometimes they're big, scary, like storm clouds. And sometimes they're kind of foggy and dense and, and you're just watching them go by. And so the reason that it, um, meditation is recommended so much for healing from trauma is that 
it allows us to interrupt the thought patterning. And so all of us have repetitive thoughts that go through our head all the time during the day. And for many of us, we don't even notice they're there. It's just kind of, we call it the monkey mind in Buddhism, but it's just kind of like this chatter in the background. Um, and for most of us, we can ignore them. But for people who are experiencing trauma, those, those thoughts and that patterning can get very loud. And sometimes the thoughts can be very dark and difficult to deal with. And so meditation is a great tool um, to help people be able to sort of interrupt those thought patterns and retrain their brain um, to have uh, more healthy uh, neural pathways. And so, um, and mindfulness is the basis for that, is, is just being aware of what's happening without judgment. So thank you for doing that with me if you followed along. Um, and so let's talk about who experiences trauma. Trauma defined by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration um, says that it results from an event, series of events, or a set of circumstances experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening with lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and mental, physical, social, emotional, or spiritual well-being. And you guys may have seen um, the different aspects of trauma responses before. Again, I'm not a doctor, I'm not a psychologist. I'll just go over these quickly. Um, and maybe, you know, if, if you've experienced some trauma yourself, not to trigger you, but, um, or, or just experienced fear, we've all experienced fear. Um, maybe think to yourself for a moment, uh, hey, how do I experience fear? What, what do patterns do I get stuck in? And if you know someone, um, who's experienced a traumatic event, hey, how do they respond to this? So there's flight, fight, freeze, and fawn. Um, people who typically respond in a, a flight way, uh, that would be me um, when I'm in, in a scared mode, um, is generally workaholic, overthinker, that monkey mind just goes crazy, uh, anxiety, panic, OCD, difficult sitting still, perfectionist, okay? Uh, those who have a tendency towards, towards more fight, um, have angry outbursts. They can be very controlling. Um, sometimes they can be seen as bullies. Um, maybe narcissistic behavior seems like they're always focusing on themselves and their own needs, um, or, and they can be explosive um, and difficult to predict. Uh, people who experience a freezing pattern, um, a, a lot of people have felt this during the pandemic, um, is like have really hard time making decisions. They feel stuck in their lives. Um, they disassociate, they kind of space out and, you know, just kind of get lost in their phone or binge watching TV um, and, you know, sort of become hermity <laughs> um, and isolating from others and sort of just numbing out, not really feeling anything. And then uh, the fawn pattern is people pleasing, uh, having a lack of identity and as associating with other people or other things and not really having a core sense of self, um, having a hard time establishing boundaries feeling easily overwhelmed by their circumstances, and then also exhibiting codependent behaviors. So of course, you don't have to tell me um, how you experience uh, times of stress, but just sort of an interesting exercise to think about. Um, we all have a propensity um, to, you know, like go into one of these directions, propensity, sorry, um, in one of these directions when we're feeling stressed, um, you know, and if we're healthy, we can usually kind of bring ourselves out of it. Um, but what happens with people that have post-traumatic stress disorder is they get stuck in one or more of these patterns. Um, and sometimes it ends up getting diagnosed um, as, a, as a mental illness. Um, and some, some people live with it and they don't even know what's going on. Um, but just be aware that there may be patrons in your library that are experiencing these uh, symptoms. And there may also be staff members um, or you may be experiencing them yourself. So who are vulnerable um, to trauma? So as we just collectively discussed, um, everyone ha ha can experience trauma, but there are certain populations um, that are more at risk for experiencing trauma. So people under economic stress, including those that experience uh, food insecurity or homelessness, and these categories often overlap as well. Uh, people suffering with mental health conditions, people dealing with substance abuse, and the people who live with them, uh, veterans, active military and first responders and their families, uh, those with physical, intellectual or developmental disabilities, uh, BIPOC or LGBTQA plus populations, and children and the elderly. So here's some painful statistics. Um, if this is hard for you, just skip the slide and mute me. Um, about six out of every 10 men and five out of every 10 women experience at least one trauma in their lives. Uh, so if you've experienced trauma, 
uh, know that you're very much not alone in this. Uh, if you're male, 60%. If you're female, 50%. That's a lot of people have at least one trauma. Um, women are much more likely to experience sexual assault and child sexual abuse. Men are more likely to experience accidents, physical assault, combat, uh, disaster, or to witness death or injury. Of course, that's a, a gendered um, sort of statistic and doesn't necessarily mean that men don't experience sexual assault or women don't experience um, physical assault or combat because it's certainly the case. Uh, about seven or eight out of every hundred people in the U.S. will have PTSD at some point in their lives, and that's diagnosed PTSD. That's just what's recorded. That's not the people walking around with it that don't even realize they have it. So about 10, per, 10 out of every women, so 10%, develop PTSD, and about four out of every hundred men, 40%, so or 4%, sorry. So I would postulate that that's not necessarily because women um, are more likely to experience trauma, because as we see with the above stats, uh, men um, are just as likely to experience trauma as women, but it's more that maybe women seek help for it um, and uh, get diagnoses is where men don't um, or may not. I hope that changes. So that said, let's try not to dwell on the negative. Let's think of the positive. How can we design safe program spaces that allow people into our libraries or into our community centers, our hospitals, and feel like this is a place where they can um, be safe and comfortable and they're not easily triggered by what's going on around them. So I, I, I brought this uh, picture up because I wanted to ask you, and you can comment in the chat if you'd like. So to one patron, this room looks very relaxing. So this is up in the children's department at my library, and this is just set up for a yoga class. So we've got yoga mats lying there. We've got some blocks and some bean bags, and there's a few to children's toys and things in the background and, and furniture. Um, and so to some patrons, this would look very relaxing, but to another patron, this would look like a terrifying place to be. So if you'd like to contribute to this discussion, um, I'll be interested to hear what you have to say. Uh, so in the chat, if you guys can tell me what things that you see in this picture that might look, but might cause someone to feel uncomfortable or might cause someone to feel relaxed and comfortable. If you guys could share that in the chat with me, I'd really like that. And then we'll, I'll, then I'll talk about it. So I'm, wow, these are coming in fast and furious. You guys are awesome. So um, discomfort, I've walked in on a class and I'm not supposed to be here. The chair facing the mats is off-putting for me. Uncomfortable, open, might make people feel exposed. Too stark, many hard surfaces. Sitting on the floor can be painful for people with a physical injury. The picture itself is grayscale, which can be uncomfortable. The blocks could be seen as weapons. If I was going in with no knowledge, I may not know where to sit, unsure that I belong there having other people around, sterile appearance, the chair facing the room looks imposing. Mm -hmm. Who's going to sit there and watch? Comfortable having mats on the floor and safe to sit. Uncomfortable, feels a little sterile, no colors, hard floor. This is a very colorful room, by the way, but I made it grayscale just so we would look at the physical things and not so much at the colors, but that's a good point. The openness of the setting might be a challenge. Natural light is comforting, makes the space feel open. Reminds me of physical therapy after an injury. Nowhere to run to, nowhere to hide. Uncomfortable germs. Yeah, okay, these are great. Thank you so much. I don't have time to read everybody's uh, very clinical, unsettling. Reminds me of a hospital. Yeah, if I knew it was yoga, I'd know what this setup was, uh, but I don't recognize it I, and I wouldn't know what I was supposed to happen here. The entire wall of natural light, shared open space, sensory overload, hard texture, seems comfortable. Oh, these are great, 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 great. You guys are awesome. Yeah, so this is a perfect example of taking a look at this space. And so if I'm just a yoga teacher and I have no background training in trauma, um, or creating trauma spaces, and I just think, oh, I'm going to teach a family yoga class in this in this uh, children's department, and I'm going to set all, everything up ahead of time because that will be great for everyone. They can just come in and grab a spot. Right. It, it's it's a, it's a very like biased, but we're, we're it's an ingrained bias. We don't know. We just think we're being helpful. Um, 
And so, but if we look more closely at this circumstance, so you can see, yes, there's that like awkward chair facing um, the room. And so we're like, what's that, what's that chair doing? Who's going to sit there? And what you guys don't know is that chair is actually blocking an emergency exit. So around the corner, there's a door and it looks like a door to nowhere, but it's actually the emergency exit. And so that's blocking that. There's like a weird, um, you know, like that game with the, the beads and stuff. And that could be kind of distracting to people. And yes, you're right. There's this big bank of windows. Well, that would be really exposing for some people. So if I'm doing down dog and my backside is like facing a window and everyone can look at my butt, like if I have some history of trauma, I do not want people looking at my butt as they walk by the window. Um, and then, yeah, somebody mentioned, where do I sit? Where do, am I, I, I've taken away the autonomy of choice because I don't get to pick where I put my mat. My mat's already chosen for me. Maybe I don't want to be right at the front. Maybe I don't want to be in front of a window, but I kind of have to be because this is where it's set up. And also like in the background, there's, you can't see, but on that shelf, there's like an iPad um, and a bunch of wires. And if you were nervous about like recording devices or nervous about camera equipment, um, somebody listening or watching you, that could be nerve wracking seeing that there. What are that? What's that for? Is that somebody recording this class? And then also how come the teacher doesn't have blocks and uh, a bean bag and I have blocks and I'm supposed to, what are these for? How come they don't have them? Am I doing something wrong? What am I supposed to do with these? And, and yes, it's a very open environment. There's no clear exits or entrances. There's no one way in one way out. Uh, people could come out or in from anywhere, could come around from a corner and watch. Uh, there's no privacy. Um, and so, again, if you're a person who hasn't experienced uh, trauma, this may not even cross your mind, right? You might not even think about these things. Um, this might just look like, oh, they're setting up for a yoga class at the children's department. Um, but for someone who has experienced trauma, or like you mentioned, has, has, lives with a disability, this doesn't look like a fun way to do yoga. <laughs> this looks like a terrifying way to do yoga. Um, so thinking about how our spaces are set up as teachers and as programmers um, can help us be more sensitive to the people that may be coming into our classes. So here's just um, some ideas about things that we can think about when we're um, and when we're uh, creating a program. So first, identifying who's going to teach your program. If it's a staff member, or you're bringing someone in from the outside. H have you done a background check on this person, a criminal record check? Have and not that that absolves them of all culpability, um, because as we know, lots of people don't get arrested for their crimes, but at least have you at least done that, uh, a check for the vulnerable population? Um, have you checked their references? Have you called other people to see if um, they, they, you know, they are a sensitive um, and informed and experienced teacher? Uh, are you aware of the training for the program delivery? Like, is this something that you may need to have mental health first aid for? Maybe you should have nonviolent crisis intervention if it's a touchy subject or that you uh, think it would be needed. Um, do you have any implicit bias training? Are you aware of your own biases? Or the is the presenter aware? Uh, clearly marked entrances and exits and clear sight lines. So we just talked about that in the in the example. What you know, is, is it clear where I'm supposed to enter this room and where I'm supposed to leave this room or is it chaos? Consider how police or security presence may be interpreted. So in that example, if I have a kiosk off to the side with a security guard sitting there watching the yoga class, are people gonna feel comfortable with that? If you have a police officer walking around doing rounds in the library, how are the people in the program gonna feel about that? For some of us, we may not, we may interpret a security or police presence as something comforting, but for many people in the population, police or um, security presence is the opposite of comforting. It's threatening. Um, consider having social workers or counselors present um, in your library. Uh, there's a whole movement on whole person librarianship and having social workers in libraries um, or having the numbers for people available in case uh, stuff comes up during a program and you need to refer someone to a social worker or a counselor. Uh, obviously, a confidential handling of patron information. Patrons need to feel like anything that they share in the program stays in the program and that it's not something you're going to go spread around town um, if they divulge uh, personal information with you during a program. 
The library's rules and policies need to be communicated clearly with clear signage and clear words and also enforced equitably. So you can't treat your favorite patron different than you treat the guy that's kind of smelling and you don't like that much, right? They have to be treated the same way. Uh, and then reduce loud or inter intermittent noises. So if, if you have like a loudspeaker system at your library, is that necessary? Um, if you have music playing in the background at your library, I know some, some libraries like to have like, um, you know, like background music playing. Um, they think it's soothing or some staff members like it. Is it? Is there, when you have like, when you're checking out books, it's often um, the, the checkout, like the guns are set up to do like a beep, 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 beep with every, and I, and I know that that's good because it helps the circ clerk know that the, the book was scanned, but is it necessary? Is there a way to get rid of that? Um, because that intermittent beeping noise might be a trigger for someone um, who has sound triggers and sensory issues. If, if it's not necessary, do we need to have it? So just thinking about stuff like that. Consider pregnant and postpartum patrons as also vulnerable. They don't fall under, under the traditional classification of vulnerable um, populations, but birth and new motherhood can be an incredibly traumatic experience. And as we've seen um, more and more attention brought towards postpartum depression and postpartum psychosis and anxiety, um, assume that new mothers are at least slightly shell-shocked, okay? And also incredibly protective um, in many cases of their new charges. Um, and so maybe a little bit um, more sensitive than you would expect them to be in their environments. Um, and, co and consider having gender inclusive washrooms. Maybe not all of your library have bathrooms depending on the size of your building, but at least have some that are gender inclusive and that you have free access to menstrual products um, in, the, in the washrooms. Um, that can be a very traumatizing experience to someone um, to need to need a menstrual product and not be have any available. Um, and so thinking about that as well as, you know, not having an available uh, bathroom that meets how you gender identify. Think about how that may affect people in your population and try to be more inclusive. Having liability insurance um, for presenters to protect themselves in case something happens um, in the program, as well as having hold harmless and liability waivers. Um, those are so essential to sign for um, movement-based programs in case somebody gets hurt. Uh, as well, be really mindful to have photo and video release forms and then actually follow them. So if you have a patron who does not want to be recorded or does not want um, you know, you to share that information on social media, there, there may be all kinds of reasons why they don't want someone to know that they were at your program at the library. Maybe they're experiencing domestic abuse at home. Um, they're, they're, you know, it might just, they're not, might not just have, have a reason they don't need to tell you, right? They just don't want to, and that's okay. And be respectful of that. Um, and then teaching what you know. So, you know, I came in here and I said, like, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you my experience from my last 15 years of working in library services, doing what I do in my own personal experience, but I, I'm not a doctor and I'm not going to sit here and pretend that I am. Um, and then also resisting the urge to enlighten. Um, we love, we love to share advice <laughs> as humans um, makes us feel really important. I'm saying that as someone who's sitting here giving you advice, um, but uh, it can also be a subtle form of control, right? It's that idea that we know best, we know better. And um, we really in, in need to empower other people to make the best decisions for themselves. Um, and they know what's best for them. And so taking away that sort of veneer of like the expert, just because you are the person in the front of the room delivering the program, everybody is the ex is their best expert on being themselves, right? And so trusting um, that they know what's best for them. And I'm going to talk about that um, a little bit farther, further of different uh, techniques for that. And then, of course, the importance of choice. So giving patrons options of what they can and can't do in, in a program and when, like how they can and can't participate so that they have choices. And it's not just, this is the only way we do this. And if you don't do that, you're going to be publicly shamed for it. You know, that they that give them the option of putting their yoga mat wherever they want. Why do you have to lay the mats out? I know you were trying to be helpful. Again, a subtle form of control. Maybe your OCD tendencies, you like to have all those mats lined up perfectly because it makes you feel calm. But being, this is where that awareness comes into place. Is this about you or is this about creating a space for everyone to feel comfortable? And can you deal with your own issues at the same time as helping other people with theirs? 
So touching consent is a huge one. So I have these cards. There's a printout um, on my website. Uh, there's a link there. And um, Bobby can share that with you guys, maybe in the chat, the, uh, the link to my website, or you can just get it later from the slideshow. Um, but I have these cards I use for every yoga or movement-based program in the library. And on one side, they say, no, thanks. And on the other side, they say, yes, please. And that way, people don't have to verbalize whether or not they want to be touched. They can just subtly put those cards at their mat or their meditation station or wherever, whatever program we're doing, exercise of some sort. Um, and then if they know, I mean, in the pandemic, we haven't been touching anybody. But prior to the pandemic, I would go around and I would ask someone um, if they wanted to be touched, but often I wouldn't. Um, and I started using these cards instead because that way they didn't have to verbalize because for some people, um, maybe that was really upsetting to have to say out loud or embarrassing that they don't want to be touched or they do want to be touched. Maybe some people it's the only touch they've had in weeks and weeks is me coming over and touching their feet at the end of Shavasana. Um, and also they can change their mind. So halfway through the class, maybe they're starting to feel more comfortable and they're like, you know what? I would like an adjustment. And they can flip that card over and now it says, yes, please. And that's okay. They don't need to explain to me what changed or maybe they didn't like the touch and they changed it to no thanks. So these cards are really useful and I recommend you print them off and use them in your library if it's something that might work with your programming. And then something else that I use a lot is called the thumbs up approach. Um, this is a, a video that I have on YouTube that I made about trauma-informed approaches for teaching jujitsu because I'm also a jujitsu coach, um, but you could use it for library programs. And I have used it in like our uh, body image bootcamp class, for example. So the thumbs up approach is when, um, in, when somebody leaves the room or needs to take a break, you just ask the patron to give you a thumbs up on the way out the door so you know that they're okay. Um, so if something like jujitsu or self-defense class, um, people get easily triggered and overwhelmed. Um, you know, like so you're teaching someone how to break a chokehold, for example, maybe they have a really triggering experience and they run out of the room. Maybe they're crying. Maybe they're not. Maybe they're just going to the bathroom. But I need to know that if they want me to follow them or not, because if they don't give me the thumbs up, I'm following them out to make sure that they're OK because I'm not gonna leave anyone alone that doesn't wanna be alone, but doesn't have the ability to verbalize it because their brain's in fight or flight mode. So that you can watch the video. I don't have time to get into all of the me mechanisms behind why it works, um, but it's a really good approach to making programs feel safer and having someone there, perhaps yourself or someone else that's trained in mental health first aid um, can help the person have um, a, a nice conversation and get back into regulation before they come back to join the program or not. Maybe they're done for the day and that's okay too. So yoga, meditation, and other mindfulness-based programs are wonderful healing practices for all ages. I'm going to just, we only got a few more minutes and I'm just going to really quickly go through some examples of programs I've used here at my library. Um, so this is a making space yoga and meditation retreat that I taught. Um, and you can see it was a, like a full day retreat just about we did at the library. Um, and uh, it was just a really beautiful experience for myself and the patrons. Um, we had uh, meditation Fridays where people would just drop in and we'd just sit together and meditate. It was lovely. Um, I teach all different kinds of uh, accessible programs for yoga. So we have chair yoga. You can print these off. Um, these are PDFs of programs you can follow along. They're all for free on my website um, or you can find them in my books. So this is a chair yoga program um, for people that can't get down on the floor. And then a laughter yoga program, which is so wonderful. You don't need to be able to move your body at all. You know, if you can laugh, you can do laughter yoga. Uh, and then this was a program I designed uh, for children on the autism spectrum um, or that have sensory processing issues. Um, my son um, is, is um, got some issues. And uh, so I used him as my little model here, the guy in the green shirt. And, um, and this is how I get him to do yoga with me is uh, I came up with a program that makes, that makes him feel more comfortable um, because he has sort of some atypical uh, processing issues. And so you can, again, print this off. It's free on my website and you can follow along and teach it um, to any kids you may know that may benefit or print it off to parents. Um, and this is a program I did called Yoga for Heartache. I try to do this every year around the holidays, either around Valentine's Day or around Christmas or both, um, because not everyone experiences those holidays as a beautiful, wondrous occasions. Um, and so 
this is an example of a yoga program that really focuses on self-care. Um, and again, you can print this off and follow along with it if you think it would be helpful for you. Uh, Body Image Bootcamp is a class I taught along with um, Lee Thomas, uh, who's just a fabulous um, uh, counselor, and and they um, they are also an amazing writer. If you have a chance to um, read any of their writing, um, and uh, we created this program together to talk about body image in the media. Um, we specifically uh, geared it towards teens, um, 17, uh, 12 to 17. And then we did another one for adults and it was well received. And, but again, um, we had to be very mindful of the things that we were teaching in the class. And Lee was actually the first one who taught me the thumbs up technique. Um, and we used that, uh, with the participants. And so if things came up, uh, that they were talking about that was difficult, um, they, they exited the room and either Lee or I, uh, followed them and um, if they didn't give us their thumbs up and, and that's an example of when I taught a program in conjunction with someone who was qualified to talk about the things I wasn't qualified to talk about I was qualified to talk about the mindfulness experience um, and my own personal experience with trauma um, but Lee brought to the table uh, their experience um, with body image issues and eating disorders and also their experience as a counselor. Um, and so together we tag teamed as a partnership um, to teach that program. The Project of Heart is something I did in part with our First Nation community here in Woodstock. I don't know how much you know about um, Canadian history and Indigenous culture, um, but there was the entire residential school program. You've probably heard about the bodies that keep continuously being found. So a number of years ago, Terry Paul and I put together this program um, as a healing session for survivors of the residential school program and, and the people that are, were experiencing intergenerational trauma because of it, um, as well as, as something to enlighten uh, the people in our community that had no idea about this um, or just hadn't entered into their consciousness somehow. Um, and so we got together um, with a number of people from the community and children, especially from the schools, and we created um, these little tiles and every tile represented a child that had died in the residential school and we put it together and we made it in a beautiful shape of a book. Terry's an artist and um, we made this beautiful book shape and that's on the wall at the library and those children live on um, through the art project. And we had a survivor from one of the residential schools come and, and did some drumming and he talked about his experience and it was very, very moving. Um, so that was an, an opportunity for reconciliation and healing that we did here at the library. Uh, Sisters in Spirit was a similar um, program done in, in conjunction with the First Nation, um, where I taught a yoga for trauma class. Um, there's many women on the First Nation community who have experienced trauma. Um, you've probably heard of the missing and murdered Indigenous women in Canada. It, I'm sure you have similar statistics in the States. And then I also taught the women's self-defense as well. You can find more information about that program. There, I made a blog post de detailing it if you'd like to learn more. Um, and then, I, of course, I also teach self-defense classes for the general population as well. Um, and uh, that, that is always a good time at the library. And then back to talking about interoception um, and knowing how to uh, take care of your body and what's happening. I also, we have uh, programs, I have experts that come in and talk about other things like sleep or healthy digestion. Um, those all play into how we can take care of ourselves. And of course there's passive programs and alternative collections. So the First Nation um, worked with our municipality and uh, one of our churches just so we have like a green space just next to the library down a block. And they built this uh, walking uh, labyrinth for people to uh, walk and meditate and contemplate um, the joining of our communities and, and also the suffering that have ha has happened um, on this land um, when it was taken from the people who were here first. And uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful opportunity for some passive programming. Um, we tell people about the space and invite them to go and walk it on their own. Um, and so we're not necessarily leading. I have led programs at that space, but it's also just there and available. Other options that I really like are just leaving like yoga decks or meditation decks like these ones. If you look in the camera, you can see um, things like this. I, I leave them around the library. You know, they're maybe 15 or 20 bucks a pop. And if they get stolen, they get stolen. I mean, if, it, if, if somebody wants it that bad, it's that helpful to them, take it. 
um, you know, I'll buy more. Um, and they, they just contain cards uh, where people can just try out yoga poses or try out meditations on their own. And then there's no pressure. Nobody's watching them. We put them in study rooms. Um, we put them up in the family center. You know, it's lovely to see on a Saturday morning a dad, you know, trying out tree pose with his daughter or something because um, she's all excited about these cards. And so having opportunities like that or sharing um, alternative collections, like having kites or yoga mats um, or, you know, different uh, program supplies available so people can take things home. So like I teach a lot of online yoga um, through the library so people could borrow yoga mats and then take them and then follow along with the program at home if they don't feel safe and comfortable coming to the library. I'm sure you guys all have tons of fabulous ideas about ways that you could add passive programs um, or alternative collections to your libraries. Um, I wish we had more time to talk about some more, but we're getting close to the end. Um, and I also wanted to mention to not forget about your staff and yourself, right? So trauma also affects library staff and volunteers. Um, anyone who's worked in public libraries for more than a few years will have lots of tales to tell um, about some of the crazy experiences that they've had at work, um, myself included. And so we have to be really careful to take care of ourselves and each other and advocate for safe spaces for us at work, right? It's not just safe spaces for our patrons, but also safe spaces and, and safe working environments for us. Um, this is a print off you can grab from my website as well. Um, just some advice. Again, there's that word, my advice. I'm so smart <laughs> uh, for library staff. And these are just, again, these are just things that have helped me and that I know have helped other people. Um, but you don't have to listen to them as like the word of God, you know, try them. And if they work for you, great. And if they don't, no big deal. Um, I have two books available, Get Your Community Moving, Physical Literacy Programs for All Ages, and that's all movement-based programs and how to use mindfulness to create those in your space. Um, and then Yoga and Meditation at the Library um, is specifically just yoga and meditation programs. And then, like I mentioned, um, my website is full of free resources. I have an agreement with all my publishers that anything I uh, put in my books it should also, any of the infographics should be available uh, to the public because ugh, textbooks are expensive, as you know. Um, and so those are free to print off. Many of them are in two languages, in French and in English. Um, and there's videos on there and webinars and all kinds of good free resources that you are more than welcome to use. And finally, I just wanted to send a, to save a few minutes in case you guys had any questions or comments, or if you'd like to share your stories of uh, trauma-sensitive programming, I'd love to hear it. Um, you can write those in the chat and maybe myself or uh, Bobby can uh, read them. Uh, yes, the recording of this will be available later. Thank you, Jen. Yep. Um, everyone who registered will receive an email with a link to the recording once it has been processed. Um, about a week or so, you will also receive a link to claim the CE for the webinar if you are interested in that. Thank you, Jen. This was really um, interesting. I've been hosting a series of webinars about trauma-informed um, care for both ourselves and library staff, and um, I've learned a lot through these, these um, sessions. I think I, I really liked the approach you, do, you did for the yoga class about uh, is touching okay? Um, mm -hmm. I think that's really important, um, not just for yoga, but kind of for everything as we go forward. Right, yeah. It's, yeah, especially this is a whole new landscape. And I think then that one of the good things to come out of the pandemic is now we may be more mindful of how people interpret touch, you know, because maybe we're not going to just go around hugging and handshaking and, uh, you know, and for some people that's really welcome because they love that sense, that stimulus. Um, but for other people, it was like a really nice break <laughs> to, to not be touched for a few years for those of us that, um, are not so neurotypical, <laughs> it wasn't so bad. Um, and so, you know, but having the, it, this has had, an, it's an opportunity to open these conversations and that's what really matters. Right. Yep. Yeah, I, I've, I have a couple of books I've been reading about trauma-informed care for a while, but uh, I've learned something new in every webinar, so it's been really great. Um, let's see, I thought I saw something about children in the comments. Scrolling. Oh, do you target all children? When I was a child, 
I didn't know I was traumatized. Do you target all children in your programming? Yeah, I try to make um, my programming for children as accessible as possible. And I use the exact same principles um, for adults that I would for children. I never make the assumption that children are wild free creatures who have never experienced pain. Children are humans and they are sad and happy and experience pain and joy just like the rest of us adults. They've just been on the planet for just less time. But that doesn't mean I never make the assumption um, that, that their lives are all perfectly rosy and nothing bad has ever happened to them. So yeah, all of my children's programming has that same approach. So for example, um, I might do a program where we're um, creating something to eat um, pre-pandemic, of course, like I may do a juicing program and I warn them before I turn on the mixer or the juicer, this is going to be, uh, be loud. If this is going to bother you, close your ears. Oh, it's going to be loud. And so they're not surprised and startled by that response because children often don't have a way of articulating that something happens. They, they're, um, you know, or that they're experiencing an internal process um, because of something that's happened in their environment. And so you may just see them reacting, right? Um, but every reaction has an emotion or a reason, an action behind it. And so you, you might just know they're acting, acting up now, but why are they acting up? Maybe five minutes ago, they got startled by something and they don't feel safe. And so, um, and before, you know, let's say we made the juice together and then I'm pouring it. I wouldn't just automatically give them a cup and say, here, try this. I would be like, we're going to have some juice now that, that we made. Who would like to try it? And they get the autonomy to come and pick up the cup and they get to taste it and they get to decide whether they like it or not, or whether they want to drink it. And there's no shame if they don't finish eating it because for a lot of uh, children and adults that have experienced trauma, food is one of the only things that they can control in their environment. And so lots of children that have what we call picky eating habits, they might not necessarily be about the food, particularly it could be that they're not uh, having a good time experiencing texture in their mouth. Maybe they had trauma that had to do with texture um, or maybe it has to do with smells or maybe it just is more about the input and output of controlling what comes into or out of their bodies and they want a control over that. Or others might not have any boundaries at all and have a difficult time stopping once they start putting things in their mouth because the mouth feel is comforting to them. Um, and so I keep all of that stuff sort of in the background when I'm thinking about programs, even kids programs or anyone. Great. Uh, so just this isn't a uh, question, but it's a comment I really want to highlight because I think this is so important. Um, thank you for including staff as part of the library who are experiencing trauma or who experience trauma. Um, it can be hard to help others when we don't recognize and talk about our own trauma from, from work. Yeah, for sure. I have goosebumps just thinking about that. Yeah. All right. I'm going to do a quick share of my screen and do some wrap up information. So again, I wanna thank everyone for taking time out of their day to be here with us. You will receive an email in about a week with a link to the recording for the webinar, as well as the code to claim CE for the webinar. Um, we do have one more webinar right now scheduled in the series about trauma-informed care, working with youth impacted by the child welfare system. Um, so that's up and available and you can register for that. I do have one or two more in the works, so stay tuned. If you aren't already, please consider joining the network of the National Library of Medicine. Membership is institutional, not individual. Um, so do check that your institution is not already a member. You can register for more uh, free webinars and classes at nnlm.gov training. We do offer a variety of both webinars and um, Moodle classes. And you can consider signing up for our newsletter and I'll include that in the email. If you have an idea for a possible webinar, please feel free to send me an email. Um, we do pre include presentations on a variety of topics, including health initiatives for patrons, health and wellness for library staff, which I think is especially important right now, and the environmental and behavioral impacts on health. And I am going to stop sharing my screen. And we have about a minute left. Thank you again for being with us, Jen. You're a delight as always and such a great source of information. So always happy to work with you. And thank I'm you gonna, for inviting me. I am going to stop recording and thank you to everyone else. Thanks for watching. This video was produced by the Network of the National Library of Medicine. 
Select the circular channel icon to subscribe to our channel, or select a video thumbnail to watch another video from the channel.